on this week's second show. You didn't think we'd forget about Mortal Monday, did you? Well, you could all breathe a sigh. <laughs> See what you did there, Andy? A sigh of relief because the OG Outworld Princess, the clone that spits out your bones, Catalan Ogren, is here. But hey, Mortal Kombat isn't the only thing we celebrate today because it's also Game Boy's 30th birthday. Wow, I feel old. This is Nintendo Dual Screens, Episode 95, Part 2. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nintendo Dual Screens, episode 95, part 2, for the week of April 22nd, 2019. I am one of your hosts, Stephen Fontana, and with me, as always, is my partner in crime, the co-host of this disaster, the co-pilot of this train wreck. He is Andy Asimakis. How are you, Andy? My pun game is really strong your pun, lately. Yeah, you did, you're... It's, it's on fire. Yeah, definitely. And with us... As promised, as we did promise, and, and we're here, we're doing it, is Catalan. How are you? Good. How are you? Good evening. Super jazzed to have you. Um, with this You are our third uh, legacy Mortal Kombat guest of the month. We're doing a whole Mortal Kombat month uh, cool. to celebrate cool. the release of Mortal Kombat 11. Um, but Catalan, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so very much for joining us. We are very excited to have you. Um, Andy, I know you are you have been jazzed. Andy, how have you been, man? I haven't talked to you since like twelve hours ago. Yeah, um, I could use less of you in my life right now, but we're Heard. doing two shows this week. Yeah. So, um, but I'm great. Yeah. I'm a little hungry because my bear burger order got canceled for some bizarre reason. Uber Eats, I'm not man. Sure can't why. trust them. Can't trust the Uber Eats. Freaking Uber Eats. For those but of you we... who are new, sorry to cut you off. I just yeah, sure. I, 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 I don't want to hear about your Uber Eats. To be honest with you, I heard enough about it before we recorded. Anyway, for those of you that are new here to Nintendo Dual Screens podcast, this is a show where Andy and I and a guest go over the Nintendo news that you absolutely need to know about, and we have an open discussion about Nintendo's past, present, and future. Nintendo Dual Screens posts each and every Monday for your listening pleasure, and apparently sometimes twice on your podcast service of choice, including iHeartRadio and Spotify. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you could do so by going to patreon.com slash ndspodcast, just like our Patreon producers, Alex Gonzalez and Gavin McCrin. Gentlemen, we cannot continue to grow without your support. And remember, you could support us for as little as $1, which gets you access to our super secret Discord clubhouse, which is what I named it and I forgot for months that I called it the clubhouse, the Nintendo Dual Screens podcast clubhouse. But anyway, um, and you also get a bonus episode every month. All right, so before... Actually, no, we did all that stuff on, on our regular show, so we could get right into this. Catalan, I want, to, uh, I want to thank you one more time and welcome you to the shenanigans. I hope all has been well. I, kn I know that you, uh, you had a little uh, a convention not, not too long ago. Was that la two, last week, right? It was a couple weeks ago, yeah. the uh, Chicago C2E2 event or show was going on. It was really fun. Uh, a bunch of us from the original cast hung out for the whole weekend together um, and had a booth and met just so many really, really cool people. Awesome. So for those who may not know who you are and where you you got your beginnings with this whole Mortal Kombat franchise, this insane franchise that went to court multiple times and was nearly banned in America and like all this fun stuff. So how did you get started with Mortal Kombat? Well, uh, the health club that I worked out at, uh, was where Danny Piscina, who plays Johnny Cage and the ninjas, mm -hmm. he worked there and taught martial arts there. He was friends, uh, longtime friends, childhood friends with John Tobias. John Tobias called him up one day. I don't know if you guys know that story. And said, hey, I need some help with this game. I've got an idea for a game, but we've got to basically film it on the down low. <laughs> right. So that's what Mortal Kombat, uh, the original, became. So then when Mortal Kombat 2 was being designed by John Tobias, they really wanted a 
like a more authentic martial arts female character. Um, and I can't really speak for John Tobias, but I assume the female ninjas were to kind of be polarized to the male ninjas. Sure. Yep. Um, if you really kind of think about our characters and us being all the same person that we film different moves based on the character's name and they just change the color of our costume in the <laughs> yeah. game. You know what I mean? Yep. So uh, they wanted to know uh, if I had certain skill sets. Basically, Danny, I, I don't know if he was training a client or uh, work, what shift he was working, but I was at the gym and I was just killing it on the speed bag. And uh, he asked me, he said, hey, do you know how to kick too? And I, because I, he, he saw me boxing. And I said, well, yeah, actually, you know, I have a black belt in karate. So they asked me if I was interested in ch trying out, so to speak, for the game. And the only reason why I kind of, I even said yes, because I didn't have a concept of what that meant, was I had just come home from college I just graduated. My mother and my brothers and my father were members at this health club. So my mom knew Danny Piscina because my mom was such an unbelievably outgoing and friendly person that they had this kind of, I wouldn't call it friendship, but, you know, they had this friendliness because my mom would come all the time and then my brother really liked Danny. And then my brother found out about Danny being in Mortal Kombat. My brothers were Mortal Kombat fans. So there was this kind of like, oh, you have to do this. You got to meet my friend. <laughs> and then we met kind of coincidentally. And then he's like, oh, you're the sister. Oh, you're the daughter of, you know, uh, my mother. So it just kind of was a combination of really good timing. Um, as far as they were looking for someone I fit the profile was my guess um, as far as what they wanted the female character to look like and the way they had drawn her out. I wouldn't say she looked exactly like me, but she resembled me um, in, in, you know, kind of dark hair and all that kind of stuff, long, dark hair. And um, I, when they saw I could do acrobats and, you know, jump kicks and spin kicks and all these other kinds of things, it was a good, it was a good fit. It was kind of meant to be. So we actually had, uh, Danny, uh, master Piscina on the show last week. He was our, our guest last week. And yeah. so he told us the whole, the whole sneaking into midway for, for the first game and mm -hmm. completing the whole puzzle of like, cause it seems like the second game, they kind they, they gave the illusion of having their shit together <laughs> as, to, yeah. as to exactly what they wanted to do <laughs> with the second one. But, um, yeah, when I, when I was doing, I, I did a little bit of research. I wanted to see, like, because um, I don't know really a, a lot about the lore and stuff like that and, like, the different fighting styles, and, and it comes down – it does actually come down to that. And we actually had a question from one of our listeners. Andy, I don't know if you copy that. Did you see Maltese's question in Discord about uh, fighting styles? I did see that, yes. All right. Would, uh, if you have it, uh, you could read it. If not, I can read it. I could pull it up right now. All right, I got it. So – Master Piscina talked about getting into character for Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Catalan, did you go through a similar process, and were there key differences mm -hmm. in the fighting styles when creating those characters? Uh, I wouldn't say I went through a process of getting into character. Um, you know, I mean, I don't... There's no kind of... Well, I'm sure there is. I didn't, like, go through some martial art method process that sure. actors go through. Um but it was pretty much, Danny just basically had to say to me, this one's a soft stylist, this one's a hard stylist. And I was like, okay, I gotcha. You know, for us being martial artists, and I, w I wasn't even a fraction of the martial artist then that I am today because, you, you know, you add, you know, a, several decades onto practice. Sure. So even at that level, um, I had started at nine. I was 24 at the time, I think, maybe, or 25 when I filmed the game. And I knew what hard versus soft meant. And that's really all I needed to know. Then once the character uh, was defined by the weapon, then I had it. And that was really kind of like Danny asking me, what weapons do you know? And I was like, well, these are the weapons I do, you know. 
And then it was just a matter of John choosing what he wanted. And when he saw I could do size, because he didn't really, size were, were not the original character. I don't believe it was the original character's weapon. I was a Psy competitor. Ooh. And they knew that size was not going to fit uh, for the Katana character. So even though the fan was not like a competition weapon of mine, mm. I could do fan, if that makes sense. Interesting. What's the, so explain, uh, I, I mean, I don't know the difference between hard and soft. I, I assume it, hard is like just more of like an offensive, like stiff, stiffer movements and then soft is like more fluid. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot more details to the way in which they're categorized. But if we want to just be extremely generic, martial arts in general are divided into hard and soft styles. Sure. Um, soft styles generally are the Chinese kung fu deri derivatives. You know, everything from tai chi, which is got a huge internal component to it, all the way to Shaolin kung fu and wushu. Then on the hard style side, in general, I'm not saying that there aren't any soft styles in Japan or Korea. Those tend to be referred to as the hard style systems. Karate, Taekwondo, Tang. So all those, you know, um, all those big systems. So think of it as like, I've always looked at martial arts like dance. You know, these, these large categories of dance. Sure. Where I apologize for Texas coming in. I can't turn that off and turn... <laughs> keep my sound on at the same time. So in any case, you know, so think of it like ballet is a classical system. To me, ballet is what like Shaolin Kung Fu is because it's kind of the original classical form of dance that almost everything is a derivative of in a way. And then you have bigger systems like jazz or contemporary, right? And then as you get further into dance, there's all these dialects of dance, right? All the way down to like stepping and different versions of hip hop. I don't know if you guys are big dance fans. Martial arts is kind of like that, that there were these like original systems that were designed and organized mostly by you, by, by the Chinese historical martial arts community. I try to, I'm trying to be extremely generic so no one gets like offended that I didn't acknowledge gotcha. one region over another. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> if you can tell, I'm being a little bit too politically correct. That's but right. at that time for me, there was Chinese martial arts and then there was Japanese and Korean martial arts. I had a lot of training in Korean and um, Japanese martial arts, karate and Taekwondo. I had already gotten a black belt in each martial art by that time and then I had the boxing on my side but because I had spent eight years in ballet and I was a, ch uh, a child ballerina the soft style of martial arts came very easy to me it wasn't my forte when I met Danny but it came very easy to me being a dancer and then I had the gymnastics background as well so Katana's character was meant to be a little bit softer around the edges. And the fan is an accentuation or an extension of those soft moves. But here was the catch. It had to be capturable. And I know that's not a real word, but it had to be <laughs> capturable. It has, it has to read on frames. camera. Right. It had to read on camera mm -hmm. at the frames per second that they could film at. I had a, mo a little bit of a modeling background and had done a lot of stuff for my father, who was a commercial photographer. So I understood how things have to be changed for camera. So it really did work out fine. It wasn't a very hard process for me because I had done enough modeling for my dad. And I don't mean like, you know, like runway modeling, modeling, but like, you know, as a childhood model, you know, things like yeah. that. When you're in a family business, you know, you get dragged into like the model doesn't work out and they're like, hey, you want to use my kid? That <laughs> had happened enough to me that I had enough experience to understand what camera angles required and how things had to be changed. And, you know, the way in which we threw certain kicks would not be the way you would do a real kick. 
you right. know, on some of the kicks, on some of the kicks because of the angle. So, I, you know, it really did come easy. And then as John kind of saw what I could do, then I got a shot list. Ooh, okay. Once I had a shot list, they're like, we need movements in these categories, but they need to kind of look different from character to character. And right. that's where the fun came in. Oh, but that, that's he, where your was, imagination kind of runs wild a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And having Danny there for the whole thing, who had already shot several characters, done MK1, he had a really good concept of what he wanted. Um, I would even say stuff and come up with something. And I'd be like, hey, what about this from this form? You know, you know, and I would show him a piece of a form. He'd be like, eh, no, nah, that's not going to play out. You know, and it wasn't that we weren't including John in it. He was more like censoring or editing what I would even kind of what would work because he had the experience as well. Right. You know? I mean, that, that's just fascinating. It seems like you were literally the perfect person to bring in for this project, just with all your previous experience. And they just kind of, it was like stepping in dog shit. They're like, you know, they just got so lucky with finding you and, and bringing you into that project. It, it, it seems like you just have the perfect resume for, for that situation. I had, I had a pretty solid resume for this particular project. And honestly, we were all so lucky to find each other. I mean, that's at the end of the day, you know, I don't hang out with Danny on a regular basis, but he's always been the ringleader for all of us and keeping us close. I'm, and I'm really kind of referring to the original cast members yeah, because we were all from Chicago. And, you know, we went on to train together for almost 10 years after Mortal Kombat. Wow. I mean, I think I trained with those guys, I don't know. For six, seven years, you know, Ho Sung was in that mix too. So, you know, even though Danny was by all totally deserves credit for being the one that he totally was the ringleader. He just kept us all relevant in each other's lives as long as he could. And then, of course, he's super close with Rich and Carlos, um, you know, because their history goes back, well, one being his brother, but you know, Rich and him going back <laughs> to being, yeah, uh, childhood friends, you know, there's always been a really great just camaraderie behind with, with all of us. And we went on to do other projects together. So that's the other thing yep. is we didn't stop working together in Mortal Kombat. You know, we went on to do shows, performances, um, you know, independent film stuff. We worked on other video games. Some of us together, some independent and separate. Yeah, we. It, it, it's when we were speaking to uh, Danny, he was, you know, he he mentioned the falling out that he had, but it seemed to really, really hurt him to his like almost to his core, and you could see how much it meant to have the relationships that he does still have with those original, you know, two game cast members. Um, you could just see that there was something special there, that some special bond that the group of you had. And I'm glad to hear it from you as well, because it just reaffirms just how close you guys were all, all together. Yeah, I mean, it really makes a difference that, you know, and, and I'm not saying everyone was always there all the time. But I would say Tony, Danny, myself, and Ho Sung trained together several times a week for many years. Sometimes it was martial arts. Sometimes it was weightlifting. And then, and then trained and did our own martial arts without each other, if that makes sense. Mm. Like they still went to their, own, their school wherever they trained. Right. I went to my school. You know, I mean, even when I was doing, uh, you know, I got into Brazilian jiu-jitsu and they didn't. Uh, and I got into other kind of hard combat sports style martial arts that wasn't their thing. You know, and, and I, I am always very appreciative of people like Danny, even though it's not the martial artists that I am today, because they are the keepers of the traditions, you know, traditional martial arts and these traditional forms and the history and all these other elements um, have gotten watered down over decades, really honestly, with the introduction of MMA. Right. And I'm not saying MMA has ruined anything. It's it's opened martial arts up 
to so many more people do martial arts now because of MMA. And mind you, most of it is combat sports style MMA, like boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, ground fighting, and so forth. Um, but somebody has to keep the knowledge of how traditional martial arts was, is supposed to be, and continue to be, if that makes sense. And Danny really is pretty dedicated to that, whereas I've gone off more into, modern's not the right word, but like more the modern application of martial arts today, which is like the combat sports, you know, the boxing, kickboxing, tie boxing, all that kind of stuff. doesn't mean I have forgotten, you know, how to do stances or anything that, but I couldn't tell you, I couldn't do 20 forms in a row anymore. Danny could, <laughs> you know, Danny could do 20 forms back to back and they would be completely accurate, different styles. So whereas I've moved on to do some other types of martial arts practicing, you know, practicing and so forth, the Krav Maga, you know, more, a lot of the weapon work, more of the gun stuff, you know, so we kind of all have our thing that we do, but I've always admired that Danny has been very, very dedicated to the traditional martial arts. I mean, then Tony has his own school as well. Hmm. We have different kind of centers, but he has a school on the north side of Chicago, and then I have a school and a gym in the center of the city. Oh, you got that prime real estate. Well, yeah, <laughs> I've got the more expensive. <laughs> and also, ju just the, just for our listeners, who, uh, which role did, did Tony play again? Who was he in the series? So, uh, Anthony Marquez, he played Kung Lao. Mm. Mm. Kung Lao. Man, it's just hearing the names of these characters just makes me realize just how special those first, well, three, I would say three games were in my life in a very specific time. And, I always felt bad for falling out. I will say a very quick story before I kick it over to Andy because I know he's chopping at the bit here to ask you a bunch of questions. <laughs> my entire martial arts experience in my life was as a five-year-old or six-year-old. My mother signed up, my brother and I, to um, Taekwondo. And we walked in. We started stretching. And then they started doing some simple warm-up exercises. And they all screamed at the top of their lungs like when they were punching and kicking. And it scared the shit out of me. And I never went back. And that was my experience as a young five or six year old doing <laughs> martial arts. <laughs> so there, there you go. So all of this has, has been quite eye opening. I wish I would have stuck with it. Maybe I'll, you know, wouldn't be, well, wouldn't have such a good. You can start any time. Uh, Thirty three with mm -hmm. a three and a half and a one and a half year old. It's it's, whew, uh, just another thing to add to it. Although, you know what? You are inspiring me. Andy, <laughs> let me kick it over to you, my buddy, because I know you, you are dying to ask some questions. Well, I want to say on the onset, I think I am owed a lot of money because the amount of quarters I lost to those Kitana suplex moves <laughs> <laughs> were just... I would pray that I wouldn't get Kitana toward the end of the, of the ladder because I, I knew it was going to be brutal for me. <laughs> there was no escaping. Yeah. The sheer brutality of that character. And one more thing I want to add here. A fun little story before I get into actual question time. I knew from a very young age that I was a gay man. But Kitana, a little bit of questioning. Oh, like, well, yeah, I, yeah. Am yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kitana <laughs> moved the needle a little bit. I see. More Melina. But I was like, I don't know. Okay. Maybe I'm not. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Maybe it was just, you know, the uh, fantasy of just being brutalized by... Oh, a, a martial artist in the face. Well, you know, Molina, she can handle the bones pretty well. Just saying. Indeed. <laughs> Just saying. So, you know, you you got into the franchise uh, when when part two was coming out. And mm -hmm. MK1 was already, at that point, a huge household name. And it was pretty popular. But you, you came in when it was sort of bubbling up to the super height of popularity. Mm-hmm. Because part two sort of outdid the first one in every oh, way, shape, or form. It got more fatalities, more characters. We now have two females in the roster as opposed to one in, in the original. How did being in this game, did it impact your life being it was so popular? Did, people, did folks know that you were the face behind these characters? You know, I'll be honest, it didn't. My life did not really change. I mean, we got some cool trips out of it, you know. <laughs> uh, 
I, yeah, I, I, you know, but to be really honest, it didn't change our life because the company didn't acknowledge us. Right. And, yeah. it, you know, I mean, let's just be really honest about it. They, they, they just weren't cool. I mean, they, we, with the way in which the game, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say that, oh, they would have made more money with us. Right. Because right. at this point, I mean, really <laughs> more money. I mean, it's, it's, they they made so much money on the game, but I do think that the game would have made more money with us. And I, that's just kind of relative. And, you know, and what I mean by that is I think what I've learned now that makes me feel that way, especially whether or not it was right or not right for them to sell the rights to our faces and everything without paying us, which is what they did. Um, whether you think that they were had the right to do that or not, when you now see in this kind of 90s retro nostalgic, you know, revival, the number of people that we meet whose sentiments are really more attached to the early games than the later games, as far as fanship, I think they would have made more money because I know that the fanfare would have continued to grow because people got attached to characters because people were behind the characters. Right. And I think the other thing that made a big difference too is, and, and I, please don't quote me on this because I don't know if this is how true it is. They went on to hire models moving on. They didn't hire real martial artists. And then those models, the technology got better in my opinion. Well, we know the technology got better. The moves didn't get better. The they they just were just were able to more, recreate them. Right. right. So think about it. The, everything you see in Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, we physically could do. Now, slow motion, sidekick, maybe not. Uh, bicycle kick. But that's just a version of a sidekick. Right. So when, you know, you... S and that was, I think, the thing that they really didn't leverage and uh, most of us being kind of in our, not our peak, but close to our peak at that time, I certainly became more athletic um, in my mid-20s and late 20s um, than I even was when I filmed the game because I was just training more. And you just get better when you train more. It's pretty simple. Um, is that we actually could physically do that. Whereas when I do go to other events... Uh, and I know it's nice to see some of the other characters. Not every character was meant to be like a martial arts master. Some of the characters were just meant to be, you know, like Jax's characters, not meant to be a martial artist. Right. Um, I just think that uh, at the end of the day, I just, you know, I know you can't throw that punch and kick for real. <laughs> you know? So it does kind of create, I think, a difference with the fans that we've spoken to that really admire the martial art component to it versus right. people who are, you know, you love a character because you love a character, but there's a lot of love the characters because of their martial arts abilities. It seems like it was almost like it was 20 years ahead of its time. As far as the, in the business now you have performance capture and yeah. you have, you know, you have actors that are that are Hollywood movie stars that are coming in and doing performance capture for mm -hmm. video games. And it seems like what they could have had back in 1990, 91 and 92 are the first real video game stars. Mm -hmm. And what they what they what happened was the technology kind of got out away from doing that because they wanted to make things a little bit more fantastical or in some ways probably cheaper. But I, I highly doubt that when you're recreating these things from the ground up, it, it takes a long time, but it seems like that's where the, their bread and butter could have been. Cause they could have made like my connection to the characters. Uh, and now as an adult, as somebody who would go to these conventions to meet you and, and things like that, like my connection to those characters now is the fact that they were human beings yeah. behind those parts. And I can't, I come from a theatrical background. I come from playing characters and performing in film and, and, and TV and, and theater and like all that stuff. And that's my connection to, to that. And see when I f first heard as a child that those are real people, 
doing these moves that connected with me. It, it was different than, you know, a hand drawn sprite of a, a, an Italian, a short fat Italian plumber hopping on top of turtle people like that. Would, that would Yeah. And, and there's me. nothing wrong with animation. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not putting animation based, um, games down you know no, street of fighter was great for what street fighter was but there was something kind of cool about the fact that real martial artists were doing those movements now they created uh, a fantastical digitization of the movements that we did right because we don't really right. jump that high and we didn't really throw a kick that far and obviously when you add fatalities and babalities still all <laughs> an animated application of you know, the creativity that, you know, was happening at that time. But, you know, there is something kind of cool. Like, you know, we were at the C2E. It was cool to meet the original Power Rangers. The yeah. people that were physically in the suits doing it before the wires, the ones jumping off the, you know, onto the crash mats and doing all of that. That's not to say that the new Power Ranger movie wasn't awesome. But you know it's not a real person doing that. Right. You know it's CGI. It right. doesn't mean it's not cool and it's not entertaining. But there is something. It's kind of like the original stuntmen that would do all those amazing tricks on horses in the westerns. Those were real people. When they fell, they fell for real. Yeah. When they flipped underneath the horse and did that thing where they go like between the legs as they're running and come all the way back on top, that was actually done. I'm not saying there aren't people that don't still have those abilities, but CGI, because it can take it to the next level, you just assume everything is fake, right. you know? And there's still a lot of amazing stunt work that's done out there, especially in fight choreography now because of the wires and you have the fact that, you know, you can take someone with really basic acrobatic skills and now all of a sudden they can do four flips in a row instead of just... A single flip, right? right? Same kind of thing. You see these huge productions now in video games that it's almost as if you're you're taking what would what would be a two hour movie and you're making a twelve to twenty, sometimes thirty or forty hour video game where all these scenes are performance captured and they're doing these stunts with these with these motion capture suits on. There's fifty cameras on the middle at any time to capture every single movement that they do, and it's just it's you were the pioneer of that. I hope you, yeah, you like, John, know that. John was the pioneer, and Ed, they were the pioneers of thinking through that this could be done, and we could, you know, translate it to, you know, the game to a gaming console right. or platform. You know, I mean, they, without a doubt. I mean, I don't know if there's awards for most influential creators of games or I don't I don't know I assume there's an award show for what happens in the video game world I mean they deserve credit for what they did them and the guys at NBA Jam I mean they were the they were the first to kind of create this digitization of real live people physically doing the movements on green screen or blue screen to and then the technology of programming it and making it a game I mean they 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 were amazing I mean, that they did this, without a doubt, what they started and what it spawned. Yeah, it's like, it's also nuts how when you go from Mortal Kombat 2 to to the third installment, there is a very distinct drop in the overall quality of the game. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel the same anymore, the... A lot of the elements that made the sequel so great, like the the characters that are sort of like that you loved, like where they just they just vanish for for, mm -hmm. for no real reason, and it's just nuts how like back then, like little ten year old me was wondering where where is Katana, where is Melina, where is Johnny Cage, like, mm -hmm. where where do they all go? Yeah, without a doubt, Mortal Kombat Two is the Empire Strikes Back. Of yes, <laughs> that is the best analogy. And Mortal Kombat 3 is Return of the Jedi. It's not bad. It's no. nice to see these characters, but it's just not the same. And even though Star Wars was awesome and it got us all into it, I mean, it's just Empire Strikes Back is, I mean, it's a different league of what it did. You know what I mean? And I, I agree with that. And, you know, in many ways, I'm sure 
once again, not speaking for John, Ed and Ed, they probably, they learned a lot of what they could do, right? Because they just had an idea that they were sneaking into Midway and trying to get away with. Mm -hmm. So that's brilliant in itself that they did that sneaking around. Imagine if they were able to actually create the game with the support at the time of the studio. I mean, yeah, but, I but think that, that they were sounds... excited when I came on board, they were excited that they had a budget. In other words, that, that someone was going to actually sew my costume. They were like, <laughs> they thought they were treating me like a queen. I was like, well, yeah, you guys are going to make my costume. You know what I mean? So, I mean, but that's how, you know, they just didn't have like this budget, you know, and they were my weapons. We used my size. And then he picked up a fan from like Chinatown or something. That's like you know, insane. Because, how, like the most iconic elements of these characters, like the size in particular, if you, my if, competition fans wouldn't work. So it right. wasn't a prop. We couldn't create a prop because they were too small and they weren't like awesome enough. Because <laughs> like martial art kung fu fans, they're okay looking, but it wasn't going to work for the game. I mean, they make a lot of cool ones now, I guess. But the the size used in the game were actually my size, and they're still my size, you know. And other things, you know, that just all the little things we did, like. We used a microphone stand to aim at. Not that you need to come up with something fancy for that, but it was very, very raw. And they wouldn't make me two costumes. Hmm. You know, it's not like they made me a blue one and they made me a purple one. They made me a blue one. <laughs> I like as much as it's compl it's com like this whole process is held together by duct tape and and hopes and dreams and hope. Mine more, was yeah, more scotch hope. tape and rubber band. <laughs> As much as that that is the case, I I still envy the fact that you had that and were able to do it. It just seems so cozy to me to like. Just You're right, make a and it, it's situation. almost better that I would do my thing and then I'd have to keep rolling my 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 legging back up because <laughs> it they they. They weren't boots. They were satin socks. So also imagine I had to do all of that on concrete in satin socks. Like throw, that's how slippery it was. Throw and, it on a mat for God's sakes. <laughs> and then we had um I used scotch tape and rubber bands literally to keep the top of it, the knee high portion on and trying to keep the pointy part, which once again they didn't really make them that well so that it would stay pointy. It just kept like you know, like falling over. <laughs> Droopy. The tip drooping over. So then it, and then I finally, and it's funny because I finally figured out like how to throw my kick and my punch and my this and my that, keeping my socks up. Like there's all those little things. And I'm sure Danny has story after story about, oh, well, he ripped one pair of pants. I do remember that. Oh, no. Because he oh, and all those tried splits. to get it. Yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> I don't think it was the split. It was something else. He had to get in someone else's costume. And it didn't fit him, and he wore it anyway. And he was filming on, um, yeah. And then he ripped the pants. I mean, so there were all these little things. It's like it's like community theater for for video yes. game design. Yeah, do you exactly? Do you still own the costume from way back no, then? No, they took it back. I don't oh, even those know those bastards. I doubt they have it. <laughs> those commies. Yeah. How dare they? But the size, I, I, you got them, I imagine. Oh yeah, they're mine. Okay. They were they were mine <laughs> to start with. Try to be sneaky on you. Like these are ours too. Wait a minute, <laughs> you sons of bitches! It, it's in that contract we drew on that IHOP napkin. Right. It's in there. It's they're it's off. just like the whole thing to me. It, it just sounds there's there was a lot of fun to be had on that. Oh set yeah, I and mean, to, and to make these games. And and that's really where. You know, now, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't appreciate being part of the game at the beginning. I did, but it it did get stressful, like the, the lawsuit and, well, what do you mean? You know, they want this or they can do this, you know, and you're young and it's like you, you just 
want to go play with your friends, but almost like you got grounded and you can't go play with your friends and it kind of created tension between John and his friends. And, you know, whereas we really did honestly, truly all get along extremely well and we all really liked each other. And then, you know, I know John is still, of course, you know, everyone's still friendly to everyone else and gone on to do great things with their career and so forth. But um, the the best parts about being part of the game are actually kind of happening now with the revival. Just the reminder that, you know, we all get together and have such a good time. And then, you know, for someone like me with kids, it's, it's that thing that they can hold on to that their mom did. And that makes it more cool than it was 10 years ago before they were born, I guess. I mean, you're the original. You, you can't top that. And they can always <laughs> say that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they've that- kind of, they've been now to the shows because we go to comic book shows already. So for them, they understand the fanfare. Because they're fans of things. They have their own pop culture stuff that they're into. Like, have they ever explained that conversation to you, like, sitting at the lunchroom table and everybody's like, hey, the new Mortal Kombat's coming out. And you're like, you know, my mom was the <laughs> You know, I don't boy. know. <laughs> they, I think they brought it up because a lot of their friends' parents know who I am. Okay. Yeah. Spoilers. Damn. Yeah. Because if I, I mean, because every every kid had the one kid in their life. If you didn't have this person in your life, it was because you were the person. But everyone had the person that's uncle worked at Nintendo, <laughs> and w- and would tell them all the hot <laughs> secrets. I could imagine what that conversation is like. No, no, seriously, my mom was really Melina, and Katana, Katana, and Jade, and and all that. Like, no, it's come on, wonder. no, 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 for real. No, that's a cartoon. No, listen to me. I swear. Here, I, <laughs> take out your iPhone. Google real quick. Like, no, that's my mom, you dumb idiot. Well, nobody <laughs> wants to talk to me right now unless I know something about MK uh, uh, 11. Well, that's, yeah, children, they do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you think it's all the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Stupid uh, kids. It, it, it's not just, it, it's the 11th game, but it's over the course of 26 years. Like, it's been, yeah. it's been a while. Um, uh, Andy actually has his Mortal Kombat 11 waiting for him. Right now, just sitting there, he's mm. so excited to play it. But priority, Stephen. Listen, we have are, yeah. we have the OG in, in the house. Respect. So bef- okay. before we move on to our <laughs> second and and more, just to touch on uh, a very special birthday uh, for Nintendo, uh, we do have listener questions. So Andy, why don't you rattle those off? Oh yeah, let's see. There was one over here. Well, there's several actually. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> When not being used for annihilating the competition, of mm. course, are fans best used for cooling, tanning, or for the inside of your car windshield? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't understand the question. Maltese, you're, 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 it went right over. No, Our no fans way. are special. Our fans uh, are special. Yeah. We yeah. Have, yeah, we have a couple of really, really good ones. I mean, our, our friend, our resident super fan, Zach, who's a, just a special, special boy, um, he had a question, and it, it's it's one of those questions that you're probably going to roll your eyes at, but you know what? Humor the kid. Okay. How long do you think you could last in a real fight against Ronda Rousey? Not very long. You see, I said to him the, the fight would be over in seven seconds because you'd put her to sleep in six and then pose for the last second. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, first of all, she's 20 years younger than me, maybe even more. (laughs) So uh, I have no doubts in her abilities. I mean, you know, the the truth is, I also came on the scene when Mortal Kombat was happening. I was also coming into a scene of martial arts that women were not welcome. You know, my husband likes to tease me that I'm the most rejected martial arts student of all time. Hmm. Because he's been with me as we have traveled in the world, because uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of working um, all over the world. And just simply being told, you cannot come in here to train because you are a woman. So, you know, um, that's that's something that I think 
is just different. I mean, I've, I've just experienced a lot different path of martial, uh, with martial arts than, you know, I think the average woman today, which I think is great that they don't have to deal with an exclusive environment. Um, but I mean, I, for years tried to box and was not given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I'm not like upset about it or anything, but you know, Training for women today is so available and accessible, and there's just no reason why they can't, you know, there's a reason why Ronda Rousey is as good as she is and Holly Holmes, and there's so many more beyond them. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. I, I mean, it's just extensive, uh, the number of women and their complete dedication to the sport. But, you know, it used to be that you weren't given those opportunities. So, I mean, there's a lot of training I did in secret, if mm. that makes sense. There was one guy I trained with who was a black belt at another school that I really, really wanted to train. I wanted to learn a specific style, okay? And I was forbidden as a female to learn the style and to train. And I would literally, which is not really kosher, if I can use that word, Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, I would go over to this guy's house and he was older than me and I would go by myself. We would climb on a ladder on top of the roof of his garage. He would drag mats up there and I would train on the roof of his garage. So nobody would see us. Wow. So, I mean, that is just what it was, you know, you were truly um, like one of the trailblazers for this like it's it's kind of amazing to hear like i always knew a little bit about what you did for you know martial arts and in, in the in the i guess you could say in the mainstream eyes but you really were a pioneer and a trailblazer for that so. and for me you know it was i was really fortunate to run into to danny on whatever day that was because honestly because of the game I ended up meeting Ho Sung. Ho Sung and I ended up dating for a long time, but more importantly, he became my training partner. So my access to train and to learn a new style and then to be exposed to, you know, the Chinese martial arts through them and that group of people was a very positive experience. That's probably the most positive experience I've ever had with martial arts in a supportive environment. Mm -hmm. Um, because they did not discriminate and they, you know, women were very accepted in Chinese martial arts in okay. America st at that time, you know, and they were, they were not, you know, they didn't segregate me from training with them in any way, but other martial arts was a lot harder to, to do. And as I kind of started to build and find my way, to be honest, I figured out that fitness was going to be my path in. Interesting. So I used fitness as a means to gain access to either do martial arts, teach martial arts, and so forth. And then when they realized it was real martial arts, it it just was kind of a you know a blessing in disguise that. They thought it was just a fitness focus, and that's how I ended up getting my way into the publishing world. Um, my first article ever published was an Inside Kung Fu. The publisher, my editor was um, Dave Cater, and um, he published the first story that combined fitness with traditional martial arts, and it was Exercises to Improve Your Kung Fu. Whoa. And then once I did that, then the next one was ways to exercises to improve your kicks. It didn't change the fact that I was the one doing it. You know what I'm saying? Right. But if I had written them and said, hey, this is who I am. I want to write a story on um, kung fu training or on training for karate. They, I would have never been published. I would have never been. It was just it was a different time. Right. I'm just stuck on the fact that uh, that you and Liu Kang <laughs> were dating at some point. I know, we <laughs> the were. The actual Kitana and Liu Kang were in a real-life item. 
as they are in the game itself. That just blew my mind. To, yeah, so people many... got a kick out of that. <laughs> that is nuts. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, Andy, we have some other questions, I know, right? Yeah, yeah I think you got a couple. Uh, let me see here. Um, yeah, this comes from Reddit. Uh, just one of your favorite stories, like working on the game. Hmm. Yes. My favorite story? Just yeah. Your, 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 yeah, your favorite. Like, like, your, top like your best moment, like working in Mortal Kombat 2 and, and being the characters. Um, being told, could I do that in slow motion? Could I jump in <laughs> slow motion? Just like all of that was just so <laughs> funny, you know? Like you would do something and then John would look at you and go, okay, yeah, that's cool. But could you do that a lot slower? And it'd be like a a spinning kick or a jump kick. And you'd be like, like this? He'd be like, no, that's still too fast. Can you slow it down? <laughs> you know, just all of it. I, I got to tell you, I loved working with John. John Tobias was awesome. He laughed all the time. It, it was seeing his, because he, he thought all of it was cool, too. You know, he was a fan of martial arts. So when you get like you guys are all like fans of games and you get into talking about your games, he was a fan, too. So for us to just be together talking about martial arts and playing with martial arts almost as if they were toys was super fun. You guys are like real life action figures for him, basically. Exactly. Was going on. <laughs> it was it. We felt like. I don't know. It felt like playing with toys. That's how it felt to me. But we were grown ups. <laughs> <laughs> Slow motion. I'm dead. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay, now you can you fall backwards in Just... slow motion? That's <laughs> you really want to capture it. Yeah. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> uh, and then like, a lot yeah. of it was like you were kicking too high, or you were punching too high, and then they would, you know, you'd have to aim at this microphone stand that was which made sense it's cable access video games right there it's, it's fun fun stuff <laughs> I, I mean it's it's you know andy and i uh this past pax east was the first thing that we covered really together with the camera and microphones and all this thing and the whole time you know i went in with a plan but we had to improvise almost immediately based on the circumstances we were in and it just I can't imagine trying to make a video game where you just... It seems like improvisation was, like, the key component. It absolutely was. and But John was good with it. John was good with it. And think about how much more organized it was for me than it was for them the first time around. Right. right. Yeah. That's just... And that John kind of knew... Just, I mean, John and Ed, and I mean, they knew what they were doing. Like they knew what they they knew how fast it could be, and I I wish I could see all the original footage again, but I bet you there's so much that we did that they didn't use. I know there is because it was too fast. It's amazing, and and I'm sure that they put them in later games, like digitally recreated them or whatever, because they yeah, had they had all that, that source did. material. Yeah, yeah. or the I ideas that, that were left. Did. Yeah. 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 Any other listener or uh, reader questions? And that, that is it. All That's right. all of them. Beautiful. We got we got through them. Fantastic. Awesome. Fantastic. Get it? Fan. Uh, gonna... So the I pun game is strong. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> all right. So we cannot can, cannot go through the rest of this day without mentioning happy birthday to the Game Boy. Um, the the little handheld that literally changed the game for portable gaming. Um, I know Andy, you grew up with a Game Boy. I grew up with a Game Boy. G the Game Boy came out when I was like two and a half, but my mom had one always. I grew up with it around the house all the time. Um, you know, playing Castlevania, Ninja Turtles, uh, uh, Pipe Dream, and Tetris, and eventually Mortal Kombat. That system was made for I think what was it, thirteen straight year, thirteen years, maybe maybe longer actually. The Game Boy Color was 97, I think. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was around forever. Um, I think 2000, it was discontinued. So it went from 1988, 89, sorry. Yep, that's 30 years, Stephen. That's how math works. 
from 1989 to 2000 it was being created because that's how synonymous it was just when you thought portable gaming and you thought Nintendo you had a Game Boy almost everybody did um, so really quickly I just want to you, that that's kind of like my my story with the Game Boy aside from trying to play in a car with street lights and trying to get it just right just so you could see the screen a little bit um, that beautiful, beautiful flood machine. So, Andy, I want to kick it to you. I want you to tell me, uh, to say happy birthday to the Game Boy. Give me your fondest Game Boy memory. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. I was in my, um, my dad's restaurant back before it, before it shut down, when a, before a van drove through and, and, and shut it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was playing Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge, and I was trying to finish the game and you know back then there was no youtube or game facts or guides really that were at the ready to finish right. a game if you were stuck in any way but i remember having um uh, my dad's checkbook oh, no. for all the for for the guests and i oh, um that checkbook never mind yes no not, not his actual checkbook, a checkbook <laughs> oh, I got, I got to write checks for each of the yes okay, <laughs> of the diners it. So I would I was drawing out uh, the pattern for the last boss on one of the checks w- late one night, and then I, I I beat it and it was just the best feeling ever. Fucking nerd. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Catalan, did you have any uh, experience with with the Game Boy? Did, I mean, that was kind of like right in the heyday. I mean, Mortal Kombat two did come out on the Game Boy. Do you have any memories of Game Boy? You know, my brothers had him, so it's hard. Um, I, you know, at the time didn't necessarily play with the Game Boy, but my brothers, of course, had it. They were avid users and loved it, so I do remember them playing the game. And, of course, they played Mortal Kombat 2. Mm. Who didn't? Not many right. people. That I mean, that not many people did not play that game unless... I mean, I was... Oh, shit. Uh like seven eight years old at that you know, like when mortal Kombat was like start in its heyday and i i was allowed to play it my parents were not shy about violence like whatever as long as you can handle it and you're not going to punch somebody's head off their shoulders and you're not going to throw up because of all the blood have at it kid i mean you I, know it really it really goes to show you because those game boy ports of mortal Kombat one and two were rough yeah they were not great by any stretch of the yeah it, it was yeah but the fact that you had Mortal Kombat in your back pocket, there was something about that, like having it with you at all times yeah. on, the, on the school bus mm-hmm. or in the park or on the beach on a weekend. Yep. It, you just you had to have that game in your collection. And it really speaks to the franchise as just a household name in the in the 90s. Yeah, and, you know. absolutely. I mean, it came it came to everything it came to. Uh, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, uh, uh, Game Gear. Um, uh, I mean, it, those original couple of games they came they came everywhere. So there was an original, one, the original commercial for Mortal Kombat One was on on Facebook today. I saw somebody posted it, and mm. man, that brought back memories. Holy hell! Mortal Kombat. <laughs> and it's like it would flash all the consoles it was coming to. I'm like, yeah, Game Boy. So good. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. That was. I'm getting goosebumps, you guys. It was stiff. <laughs> just like, I'm um, not even joking. So <laughs> b- before before we, we go, do you have a special game for, for Catalan to play? Because I know. You know, we have, this has been a very long conversation. <laughs> yes, I, I do think so. I don't want to besmirch it with a silly little <laughs> trivia game. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I think I think we can wrap this up because I it's it's been a blast hearing all these stories. And uh, little kid me is... Is, is happier now knowing the things he knows about where the series started and your your impact and your influence with it and i just i want to thank you for being a part of this amazing franchise and you made a mark on me as a kid um, hey, oh i'm glad and i would hope to young gamers out there you know back in the day um when there was no real like strong female characters as well like you were again just a pioneer of pioneers back right. in the day. So just Thank you. kudos to that. And yeah, Molina was my shit. <laughs> always is. Always will be. <laughs> and he's not just saying that he has said it multiple, multiple times. We've done right. many, many, we, we did a whole 
recap of the entire lore of Mortal Kombat as a bonus episode one time. And yes, uh, it, Melina has come up many a time. It is truly one of his favorites. Um, I, I just want to thank you again for joining us. Um, it was an absolute honor having you here and learning you. about your career. You were absolutely wonderful guest. And anytime you want to talk about anything, if you, if your, your kids, as, as they grow up, if they have questions, you have our contact information. We do. <laughs> we have tons of guests on our show, indie developers, uh, voice actors, whatever it is, if you have our contact uh, address. So if they ever want to know the inside yeah. scoops, they could contact us. We'll, we'll give them a little hand. We could be uncle Nintendo if they want. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Um, so that is going to do it for for our wonderful part two, n- episode ninety five, part two. Remember, Nintendo Dual Screens podcast is part of the Proving Gamer Podcast Network, which includes Trophy Horse, a PlayStation podcast, and Game Stuff, a general games discussion podcast. You could follow our show on social media. We are at NDS Podcast. That's at NDS Podcast. I am at Bat Child twenty seven, and Andy is at Pants Guy. Um, you could also join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash NDS podcast. Uh, Catalina, do you, do you have any social media that you want people to follow you and just kind of? Sure. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, uh, it's, of course, at then Catalin POW, P-O-W. And then my uh, facility or my gym is POW Gym Chicago. Awesome. And is there a website for, for the gym? PowJimChicago.com. Perfect. Awesome. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes so that people could, could visit it. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, Andy, before we leave, is there anything? I know you, we have our next guest lined up, our final Mortal Kombat guest. Would you like, oh, yeah. would you like to tell the folks? Who's well, I want to say one thing before we, we kick it to that is just okay. I'm, I'm going to book a flight now to Chicago and get a, uh, a one-on-one for a slow motion kick tutorial from yeah. from, <laughs> from Kitana. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're wrapping up this Mortal Kombat month. It's been a lot of fun getting all these voices on both you know past and present. And we're jumping right back into the thick of things with, uh, I would say, the ultimate guest to end this celebration. We're getting... Uh, Richard Epcar, who voices Raiden for the mm-hmm. past three games, so mm-hmm. he's been uh, a huge plot point in these in these new games uh, recently. So that's going to be a great little bow to wrap. He this is he is party the with. albatross of the Mortal Kombat series as of late. He has really screwed the pooch, and he's got a lot of explaining <laughs> to do. Uh, so very exciting that we're going to be ending with the uh, Thunder God himself. We started off with uh, Tony Chung. Uh, the current model for Sub Zero. We had Master Piscina. Now we had Catalan. And then we're going to end off with the current Raiden. So it's been one hell of a ride. And Andy, I do want to thank you because it was all you getting these guests. And you're you're the one that always books our guests. But I know you worked really, really, really hard to get these Mortal Kombat um, pioneers uh, on the show. And I just wanted to thank you very much for doing that. It's been an absolute blast. Um, so that is it. That's going to do it for us, folks. This has been Nintendo Dual Screens Podcast Episode 95, Part 2, for the week of April 22nd. And as always, please be excellent to each other. Thanks, guys. 